Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. I want to tell you about a new documentary. It's called Little Girl. It's set in France in a small suburban town. Little Girl centers around Sasha, who's eight. When the movie opens, you see Sasha get ready for her day. She's just put on a sequin dress. She fusses with her hairband. She tries on a silly hat, takes off the silly hat, then goes out to play in the snow. In the next scene, it's Sasha's mother. She's talking with a doctor. She tells him, in French, Sasha is a little girl. The doctor starts asking pointed questions. How do you know? He uses male pronouns for Sasha. Sasha's mom walks the doctor through all of it. She's polite, of course, but you can tell how exhausting this all is for her. In Little Girl, directed by my guest Sebastian Lifshitz, that's more or less the film's conflict. It dominates the life of Sasha and her family. Everywhere Sasha goes, school, the pool, ballet class, the department store, explaining who she is, answering questions, fighting to clarify something that's so simple. Little Girl shows in very real and plain terms what it's like to be a transgender child, to be part of that child's family, to raise and love that child. It's a beautiful film. By the way, you might hear as I talk to Sebastian a little bit of emotion in my voice. That's because one of my own children is transgender. So let's get into it. My conversation with director Sebastian Lifshitz. Well, Sebastian, welcome to Bullseye. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Hello. Why did you want to make a film about a transgender child and their family? Well, first of all, I would like to say that I'm French, (laughs) as you can hear. And my English, you know, is not like uh, fluent, but I will try to do my best. It's better than my French, Sebastian. (laughs) Okay. So the idea of the film came from a conversation that I had with Bambi, not the character of the Walt Disney movie, of course. Bambi was one of the first French transgender women in France. And she had uh, an amazing life. And I did a film portrait about her. And I remember she was born in 1935, so a long time ago, in Algeria. And I remember during a conversation with her, I asked her when she realized that she was a woman, if there was a a special moment, a specific moment where it was like obvious for her that she was a woman. And she answered that, for her, she, she she didn't have a kind of uh, revelation at a very specific moment. You know, she always felt as, as a kid that she was the other sex, you know, she, that she was a, a woman born a, as, a, as a boy. And so I realized that uh, so you could have this this feeling, this, uh, this certainty when you... Uh, when you are a kid, you know, and I didn't know that at that time. I thought like like a lot of people that uh, dysphoria, uh, the trans identity uh, could uh, normally appear uh, during puberty or with the beginning of your sexuality. And of course, it has nothing to do with this. And so I've realized at that time d- during that conversation that you could be a very young kid and have this uh, certainty of your identity that you are the other sex and so I thought that it could be a very um, great idea you know to make a film about that just to find a kid with his family and to make a portrait during a year of his life and to see how it goes you know with with his family with his brothers and sisters with his friend at school everywhere because I remember when I started to do the film well, to have this idea first, I didn't know any film that was a, a, a trans kid uh, from that age, you know, very young age. 
it's very sensitive to make a film about a child, a documentary film about a child. And it's very sensitive to make a documentary film about a family and the, you know, the intimacy of a family. And the fact that you're, we're making a film about a child who was transgender, you know, amplifies that sensitivity. So were you nervous about that at all? Or did you feel comfortable that you would be able to represent your subject in a sensitive way? I was not nervous, but I was questioning myself during the whole process. Like, uh, for example, the, the consciousness of Sasha. When I met her, she was seven years old, seven and a half, and the shooting was like for a year. So at the end, she was eight and a half years old. And I was very curious to know if she was really aware of what's going on, you know, with the film and to be filmed. And then it's going to be at the end a film that it's going to expose her. And I remember that she was in a way very smart and very aware of what was going on. I, I give you an example. One day I asked her at the very beginning of the shooting, do you think it's possible that I can go to your room and film you there playing with your toys. I knew that the, this room was really special because she wasn't able to invite anybody in that room for many years because it was full of uh, girly toys and her clothes and it was her kingdom as she named it. And um, so after a few seconds, she said to me, yeah, okay, you can come. So we went there with the camera, and when we were ready to film, she just sat on her bed, making no movement. And so I was a bit surprised, and I said to her, don't you want to play with your toys? And she looked at me and she said, well, no, you're here, and normally I'm alone when I'm playing with my toys. And I said, yes, of course, I understand, but you know, I'm supposed to make a film. So... Don't you want to play just for the camera, just for me, with, with your toes and pretending that I'm not there? And she looked at me and she said, well, but you're there. So I can't do it. And so I was a bit disappointed, you know, um, for like a few minutes. And then I realized that she was so smart because it was a way for her just to tell me, I'm not going to act for you. I'm not going to pretend that I'm doing something for the camera. If you have to film me, it has to be in the moment, you know, because I, I'm, I'm doing something already. But not, I don't want to be an actress or to fake, you know, the situation. And so for me, that answer of her was a kind of guarantee that she never, she would do something that she doesn't want to do, and especially for the camera. And I remember also a second moment with her, which was quite an amazing moment. That shot, it, it is actually in, in the film at the very end. She's playing on her bed and she was waiting for us to, to prepare the camera as for a second time. And she was putting her head upside down, playing like this alone. And the light was so beautiful. It was uh, there was a lot of shadow and my cinematographer just kicked me and said, just look, this is beautiful. We, we should film immediately. So this is exactly what we did. And after maybe 30 seconds, Sasha realized that we were filming her and she could say something, you know, she could say, uh, are you filming or what are you doing exactly? But she didn't say anything. She really understood what was going on. And she just looked in front of the camera, right into the lens. And just to say, I know what you're doing. I'm fine with it. You, you can feel me, you know, without any words. And that was a, a second moment of her, for me, of her consciousness, you know, of what was going on, you know, with, with her and the camera and the act of filming. And uh, so that for me was very important. And then to answer to your question about the family, 
Well, I remember that the family, as soon as we arrived with my crew, because the question is not only about me, it's about the whole crew. We were four people, me, my cinematographer, the sound engineer, and my assistant. And each member of, of the crew needs to be accepted, you know, and, and need to find a place where they feel nice and intimate, you know, with each member of the family. Because otherwise, it's impossible to do a documentary, especially this kind of documentary with this part of intimacy and all the daily life that you're supposed to film, you know, of, of each person, you know, of that family. But I remember that very, I don't know, it took us like maybe one day or two, even less, just to have a kind of trust, you know, with, with each other. And they have adopted us, you know, very, very quickly. And we were like a part of the family. How did you find Sasha and her parents? I found Sasha on internet on a forum because first I thought that it would be easier to go to see some association or to go to some schools. But then I realized that my idea was so stupid because most of the time the parents who has a trans kid, they are a little bit lost and alone. They don't know uh, where to go and, you know, to who to ask some advice, especially in France, because there is no institution. There is quite nobody who can help you. So most of the parents feel so lonely and sometimes a bit desperate, you know, with the situation because they don't know how to answer to the, to their kid or what to do concretely. And the mother of Sasha was in that situation for like three years or four when I met her. And so um, that's why you have this. For so some parents have created a forum on Internet just to exchange their experience and, and to give some advice, you know, to help each other. And so I put an announce there and to say that I was looking for a family with a trans kid because I, uh, I wanted to do a documentary. And the first reactions were very aggressive because I think this community were very afraid that someone could do such a film and with a kind of wire and spectacular, I don't know, um, desire, you know, to get something um, extraordinary or whatever. And so it took me some time, you know, to explain exactly what were my intention and to reassure everybody that, you know, I didn't want to do anything that was extraordinary or, you know, like spectacular or whatever. Um, my position was at the opposite, you know. I really wanted to be into a family, into the intimacy, and to be uh, as close as I can, you know, to what they what they live every day. I've been in those groups, not the French ones, obviously. And the tone of the discourse is very different from any other online place I've been because there is this extraordinarily raw intimacy that is born of people who, as you said, in many cases don't have other support, sometimes don't have other people supporting them within their own families. And so to find people who understand is yeah. a really big deal. There's also the opposite of that because there is very reasonable fear of people from the outside because there are people who go into those groups and try and use the information that's shared against, against the members. It must have taken a lot of work to show yourself to be, uh, I don't know if it uh, translates to the French, but an honest broker, that you were there for the reasons that you said you were, and that those reasons were reason enough to trust you. I think it's it was something very intuitive from me and from the family. It just, I don't know, 
I remember the first meeting with the mother of Sasha. She didn't want to introduce me first to everybody. She wanted to see me alone. And I remember she was exactly like in the film, very emotional, very frontal, and very true. And immediately I liked her, you know, because she was so sincere. And probably she felt something, I mean, I cannot talk for her, you know, but probably she felt that she was in trust uh, with me and I could understand her because for like three or four years, she was so alone with absolutely no possibility to speak to anybody. And um, she was in a way a bit desperate with the whole situation because all the things that she that she has done with her kid was intuitive, she, but she wasn't sure if it was the right things to do, the right answers to give to Sasha. And also because of the school, the school was so problematic for her and with Sasha. So at one point, you know, she, she, she wasn't sure with everything. And so she was questioning herself like all the time. And for the first time when we met, she had someone in front of her that was not judging her and I was full of comprehension and empathy and probably because of that you know she said okay maybe something is possible so she said to me okay in two weeks if you can come back I will introduce you to the whole family and you will see if it could work you know all together and I said to her you know I will be delighted, of course, to meet everybody, but don't be afraid, you know, there is no obligation from myself and from you, you know, everything is open. And if you don't want to, to go further, there is no problem. And I remember the first day when I arrived in that house, it was for a kind of tea party with cake. Sasha was very shy. She was Uh, hiding herself behind her mother like a little cat you know and she was really sweet and I wasn't pushy you know I, I, I was patient and little by little after maybe maybe one or two hours she came and talked to me and I don't know very easily she was I think she felt secure and interest too I think And my first impression with that family was the feeling of love. That was something really, really strong. You know, normally when you arrive in, in a house full of kids, <laughs> you can hear them shouting, you know, it's full of rivality and, and, you know, and it's sometimes you have a kind of tension. But in that family, I don't know, everything was kind of, everything was peaceful. And you could feel really in the hair there was something that was between everybody full of um, yeah, love and protection. And I've realized that probably because of the situation of Sasha, her brothers and sisters have learned how to protect her, really to build like a shield around her for years They were so aware of the difficulties at school and even outside that they had this attention all the time with her. And that was probably, I could feel that love, you know, surrounding her all the time. Even more with Sebastian Lifshitz after the break. Stay with us. It's Bullseye for MaximumFun.org and NPR. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. My guest is Sebastian Lifshitz. He's the director of the new documentary, Little Girl. It's a profile of an eight-year-old transgender girl and her family living in France. Let's get back into my conversation with Sebastian Lifshitz. Did you have an idea in your mind of what a family with a transgender child would look like? Not literally with your eyes, but how that would work, what it would be like when you got there. Did you imagine something before you? No. 
When I start a film, I want to be ignorant in a way. I don't want to expect anything. I try to have an open mind and to, I don't know, to see what the reality of every day is going to, what it's going to bring me, you know. I don't want to, because the thing is, if you go there with a kind of pre-knowledge, you know, you just, you just want to verify what you already know. And this I don't want, you know. I prefer to discover and to live the moment and, and not to get something that I already know. So I had absolutely no idea of what could be a family with, with a trans kid. Maybe the only intuition I had was a kind of, for me, because it could happen everywhere, you know. So a kind of traditional family There was something, actually, that I didn't want. It's to get a family from a big town, you know. And for me, that was important to be in a, in a kind of modest family, uh, from, you know, from the working class with, you know, that everybody can relate to that family. They're not rich. They're not, you know, with full of knowledge or whatever, you know, these kind of things. It's, it's a very banal family. And this I, I really loved about it. You know, the, the family of Sasha, for me, can be the family of everybody. One of the first scenes in the film is Sasha's mother talking to, who I presume is maybe the, the family doctor, about Sasha. And for me, watching it was stomach churning. What does that mean? I felt sick. It was difficult for me to watch. And it wasn't because the family doctor was hateful or cruel or bigoted. It was because he seemed to be a family doctor. He was, you know, you don't generally become a family doctor if you're not a caring person. And he was misgendering Sasha, putting Sasha's mother through a kind of test, kind of examination And it reminded me of all the times that I felt like the people in my life who were responsible for caring for my children were accepting my children conditionally, only on their own terms, not on my children's terms. No, you know that doctor, the family doctor, was not a mean person. The thing is, for me, he represents the majority of people, what the people think about trans identity and with trans kid, you know. He's, <laughs> in a way, he wanted to be kind and supportive, but his words, his questions were horrible and create a kind of guilt for the mother. And, but the thing is, What you see there, exactly, this is the situation of the family and the mother. She has nobody to talk with because the only thing that she will listen, it's going to be this kind of stereotypes and, and crap thing, you know, about probably it has something to do with you because maybe you had a desire to have a, a girl or, you know, all this stupid um, presumptions, you know. And so, but that moment was really important because it brings to the film the incarnation of what the majority of the people think, you know, in this kind of situation. And even the mother of Sasha wasn't sure of everything. She also questioning herself, you know. She's so fragile And especially at the beginning of the film, because she had nobody to talk with for so many years. And um, that the, the sad 
part of it, you know. This man is supposed to be kind. He is a kind person, caring person, but his words are terrible. That happens a lot. Yeah, it hurts. It hurts all the time. And so you have to find a path, and it's so difficult. Sometimes you're so tired because you have to convince all the time. You have to change the mentalities. You have to face the fears of the others. So, no, it's a struggle. You have to check. I mean, not even convincing people, but just everyone. You have to check ahead of time. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's like your kid's going to summer camp. You got to talk to the head of the summer camp. You got to talk to the summer camp counselor. You have to talk to the other summer camp counselor. You have to find out if there's going to be substitute summer camp counselors and where they're going to come from and how they're going to speak to your child. And that's in a world where everyone is on their team. You know, that's, a, that's in a best case scenario world. It never stops. I know. But the thing is, the decision of the family and Sasha to make the film was based on that because they thought that at one point you need to decide to be visible and to confront people. This is the only way. When you look at the history of the gay community, things have started to change when people went into the streets, when they decided you know, to talk and to say out loud who they were really, you know, And for me, it's the same situation, you know. At one point, you need to, to be out, you know, and just to say with dignity and proud and who you are. What was it like for you to be in that room with Sasha's mother and the doctor? And it's something that you're relatively new to, but you're all sitting in there with a... I don't know, a boom microphone and a, <laughs> and a camera. You mean with the doctor family? Yeah. It was painful because I could feel the pain and the, the difficulties of the mother, you know, to, to express and, and to answer her thoughts, you know. But I knew it was also a necessity. Sometimes the documentary put you in a, in a cruel situation because you know that you have to film some moments that are difficult, but it's, it's a necessity for the film. I knew that I wasn't doing a kind of Walt Disney movie where everybody is kind and happy and fun. And there was a fight going on, you know, into the life of Sasha and, and, and the whole family, not only with the doctor, Uh, actually, he was a kind of of carry person, but the fight was with the school, and this fight was with the class, le uh, with the dance lesson, and with the others in general. You know, that was really a big fight. When you first talked to Sasha and her family before you started making the film, did you talk to them about why? they might want to have their lives documented? Well, they said exactly what I told you before, that they felt that, I think they were really fed up about the fight that was going on with the school for like one or two years. And at one point, I think the mother and Sasha said, okay, how can we change things, you know? Because... The reality of Sasha, as soon as she was at home, was peaceful, was obvious, was there was no problem. So she couldn't understand as soon as she was out of her house that it was a kind of nightmare, you know, that she had to live with fear and something was stolen from her. That moment of life, you know, when you are so young and with no defense, you know, 
and she couldn't be like the other kids, you know, and and to be at ease and and happy and and to tell exactly what was her feelings, you know, with herself. So she had to live in a secret place. And that for her was really painful. So probably they felt that they need to to break the bubble, you know, the 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 family bubble and and go into the fight, you know. That was enough, you know, enough is enough. And probably that was the moment where they met me. Yeah. There's a beautiful moment in the film where Sasha's mother and father are talking about meeting with the principal of Sasha's school who has been maybe not actively hostile to them, but has been presenting as many barriers as he can to Sasha's gender being affirmed in school. And there's just this moment where they've gone to see a a gender specialist. They've had to travel to Paris to do it, to get a letter because he asked for a letter. And he said, well, we, I have the letter and I'm looking forward to seeing him. And if he doesn't like it, I don't remember exactly how it's translated, but she basically says he can stick it, <laughs> you know, like she, he can shove it. And that really, that really hit me in the gut because it is a choice that one has to make so many times, which is where is the point where someone who is perhaps not evil, but whose actions are having awful consequences, you just have to tell to go suck a lemon and keep using <laughs> English language aphorisms. <laughs> But it's such a moment in the film. It must have been hard for you to watch all of the moments where Sasha's parents struggled with becoming comfortable telling people to go shove it. All the moments where they were sitting there with those doctors and you know, that family doctor who, you know, probably looks at a lot of tonsils all day mm -hmm. and does so in a kind and thoughtful way. Because dealing with those in-between people is so hard, like the horrible trauma in the dance class, which happens in the film. Well, that's a bad guy, you know, that's, that's easy. It's easy to tell a bad guy to go mm -hmm. stick it, but it's a lot harder when somebody is getting you caught in their in-between. Of course, I mean, well, this is society, you know. You have the bad guys, you have the ambivalent people that on one hand they will understand or they could pretend to tolerate a part of it. But then on the other hand, they will tell you this and that. And uh, of course, I mean, this is human nature, you know. You, you have to face so different attitudes and beliefs and... And you have to deal with it all the day and every day. So, but you know, the, the most problematic was with the school because this school is for a kid. So it's a very important place where you learn, where you have social uh, relation with other kids, with other adults, which are kind of models for you. So could you imagine for Sasha how it was, you know, to be in that school who was so hostile about her, about what she wanted to say? And for her, it was obvious, you know, that the school was not ready to accept and to understand and to create a dialogue with her about her dysphoria, you know. And... That was for me the, the most shocking things, you know, because I've tried myself as a filmmaker to create a dialogue with the school, to be able to film there and to explain to them 
what trans identity is, I also propose that they could meet the pedopsychiatrist uh, that could give them a kind of lesson to explain everything because all these people were so ignorant, you know, but pretending not to be, of course, and to know everything on everything. And um, so for me, that was the most uh, outrageous, you know, thing about these people. Because these people are so important in the life of Sasha. This is the people that are educated her. Uh, no, that are educate her, sorry. <laughs> Sometimes my English is really a bit difficult. Um, yeah, so that was... The main struggle was there, actually. And what's that Latin in loco parentis? Is that what it is? That is the parents in the absence of parents. That when your child is at school, those adults are are the ones who are serving as their parents. And if they can't bring themselves to show up for the meeting <laughs> to talk to the psychiatrist, <laughs> how can you leave the, your children with them? It's a, it's a horrible decision to have to make. But you know the paper that the mother of Sasha uh, got from the hospital was really important because that paper was a way for her to, how do you say that in English? She could pursue them with that paper because that document officialized the situation of Sasha. So it was very important because it was for the first time that Sasha was considered as what she said, you know. So then the school, because before that, the school could say to the mother, oh, this is, um, this is not a really serious wish of Sasha, you know. And in French, we say a caprice. You know, sometimes kids, you know, they ask for something and... You, um, a phase or... Yeah. yeah, a phase, let's say, yeah. But then with the paper... Everything has changed, you know. It was a really important moment into the film. We'll wrap up with Sebastian Lifshitz in just a minute. When we return, Sebastian tells us how Little Girl has impacted the people who see it and what they tell him. It's Bullseye for MaximumFun.org and NPR. This message is brought to you by NPR sponsor Airbnb. Millions of people earn extra income by hosting their extra space on Airbnb. Income that can help with home renovations, paying for vacations, or saving for retirement. Maybe you have questions about whether hosting might be right for you? You can now ask a super host and get free one-on-one -on -one help from Airbnb's most experienced hosts. Go to airbnb.com slash askasuperhost and start asking. Hi, it's me. Dave Hill from before, here to tell you about my brand new show on Maximum Fun, the Dave Hill Good Time Hour, which combines my old Maximum Fun show, Dave Hill's podcasting incident, with my old radio show, The Damn Dave Hill Show, into one new futuristic program from the future. If you like delightful conversation with incredible guests, technical difficulties, and actual phone calls from real life listeners, you've just hit a street called easy. I'm also joined by my incredible co host, the boy criminal Chris Gersbeck. Say hi, Chris. Hey, Dave. It's really great That's to... That's enough, Chris. And New Jersey chicken rancher, Des. Say hi, Des. Hey, Dave. The Dave Hill Good Time Hour. Brand new episodes every Friday on Maximum Fun. Plus, the show's not even an hour. It's 90 minutes. Take that, stupid rules. We nailed it. Welcome back to Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. My guest is Sebastian Lifshitz, director of the new documentary, Little Girl. Let's get back into my conversation with Sebastian Lifshitz. You hear so often people say, when I was six years old, I thought I was a dog. And <laughs> it's so insulting. <laughs> and so it's the most sickening, just enraging thing to hear from someone when I was six, I thought I was a dog as though children make these decisions about their lives, first of all, as though it is a decision. And 
as though children make decisions about their lives the same way that they make decisions about what pretend games they play. It's not a question. It's just a thing that happens and it's made me so mad. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sebastian. I'm not used to doing, a, you know, it's an arts and culture interview show. I'm not used to doing things that are so, uh, that are so close to me. Okay. But I see you are emotional with this, with a subject. I understand. But, you know, I can tell you something about Sasha, maybe that could be important for you, is that during the filming, Sasha was obsessed with all the signs of femininity. It was for her, I mean, the colors, the type of toys, uh, different type of plays, and, you know. And after the film, when she has been accepted as a girl at school, Her mother told me that she was less obsessed with all these signs and she was more into a kind of fluidity, that she was okay to wear blue colors <laughs> or to play with boy games, you know, these kind of things. She was more confident, you know, and she didn't have to, to say uh, so much the person she is. And that for me was something very positive in a way because Sasha was able also to um, to accept, you know, to be, I mean, to do something that a girl is not supposed to do and, and not to feel threatened, you know, by that, you know. And she could do whatever she wants. Now she knows who she is and and she has been also considered as that person. So that was a very beautiful um, conclusion in a way. That happened with my daughter when, when she transitioned. She would only wear pink and purple. <laughs> and I don't, I don't really like pink and purple. I was like, can we wear some other stuff? <laughs> and, you know, that faded with time. And I, I, I think you're absolutely right that, you know, a five-year-old or a six-year-old or a seven-year-old only has so many ways to tell the world who they are. They only have a certain understanding of how to express to everyone this thing that is so central to who they are. And when the stakes are no longer so high, when telling everyone their gender identity is no longer the single most important thing in the world to them because people around them are supportive of their gender identity, so it's not a big deal it changes the <laughs> it changes the equation very much yeah absolutely yeah what did you not expect to see that you saw what did you not think even was um was going to enter the picture that surprised you there was something a bit magical about that shooting there was some moment of grace, of synchronicity, that I was really amazed, you know. I remember I was in the garden and Sasha was playing there and then she took a, a kind of water full of soap and she's she has tried to make some bubbles, you know, in the air. And then she wanted just to uh, to get that these bubbles in the air and the moment was so poetic and so magical and she had a kind of grace you know just to move her hands and to look at the bubbles in the air like that I don't know this kind of little moments you know of nothing but for me these moments were everything because you could relate to her you could be so close to her Because I was obsessed to translate her inner life, you know. And um, and these moments were, for me, a way for her, to, I mean, to, to show who she was, you know, these kind of things. And also I remember the first meeting with the pedopsychiatrist. Sasha was so excited, but also she was scared, you know, to talk to that doctor because she wanted so bad to be considered as a girl and 
and she felt like this doctor had this power just to say, you are this or you are that, you know. And it was so scary for her. That's why, you know, that moment was so intense for the mother and for her. You know, that my presence or the presence of the camera didn't count for anything. You know, she was really... She put her eyes into the eyes of the doctor at that time. And she was lucky, you know, to, to meet that doctor, actually, because Dr. Barjaki was a very comprehensive and, and wonderful doctor, you know. Not at all pushy or she was really, she was uh, very full of empathy which is not common, you know, for pedopsychiatrists. They're not all like that. Yeah. And um, so it was a very important moment for her. It was moving to me to see that psychiatrist accept Sasha so comfortably on Sasha's terms. There was no telling. There was listening. Mm -hmm. Because the idea is, is to create a connection. This is a moment of discussion and, as you say, of listening. And the first meeting is so important because this is the base, you know, of what the relation is going to be, you know. And you're right that a pediatric psychiatrist is not always... The listener that you wish they would be. <laughs> I'm not going to name any names, Sebastian, but that's not always how it goes. Of course. I mean, when you look at the history of what happened to so many transgender uh, people, person, you know, they have been fighting with the psychiatrist uh, world uh, for so many years. And... Yeah, of course. You know, they in French we say uh, that le passif is um, is huge. Like uh, the the history is 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 difficult. Right. There's a lot of baggage. We would probably say. there's a lot of baggage. Exactly. Yeah. That <laughs> that the words I was looking for. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're transgender, whether you're a child or an adult, you're used to having mental health be used as a weapon against you. Of course, and they have a so strong power on you, and this is impossible in a way, that they have the power to tell you who you are and to help you to become uh, physically also who you are. And it's a huge power, actually. What do people talk to you about when they talk to you after a screening? What do they ask you? What do they tell you? To be honest, the thing is, after the screening, people are so moved. So it's a bit difficult for them to talk immediately. And I was really surprised that the film in France could interest so many people. When the film was broadcast, more than three and a half million people have watched it. Wow. And that was, I mean, that's a big number, you know, for France and especially for documentary film. So I was really, really surprised. I, I was not expecting this at all. And I understood probably that the film was about a lot of things, not only trans identity, it was also, the film was also questioning what is femininity, what is masculinity, what is what are the models and the pressure that we feel since we're kids with this uh, model of identification? And are we really free to be who we are? Or do we conform ourselves all the time to those models that um, society has given us, like every day, on films, on with stories, with, at school, everywhere? And probably the new generation wants to question that, you know. Well, Sebastian, it's a, it's a beautiful film. I'm very grateful for it. And I'm 
very grateful to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sebastian Lifshitz. His movie, Little Girl, will be released digitally on November 16th. It's really beautiful. If there's a gender non-conforming child in your life, uh, my family has received caring and invaluable guidance from the folks at Gender Spectrum. Uh, they provide resources and training around gender in kids, not just for families, but also teachers and doctors and mental health workers and other professionals. They're online at genderspectrum.org. That's the end of another episode of Bullseye. Bullseye is created from the homes of me and the staff of Maximum Fun in and around greater Los Angeles, California. In my neighborhood, many houses have dragon fruit plants trellised across their front yard. They are these extraordinary long cactusy things, and they grow the incredible, almost science fiction fantasy-ish dragon fruits on them and those dragon fruits are starting to turn red and come ripe and I'm hoping I can scam a few from a neighbor maybe they want some of the grapefruits that grow in my backyard our show is produced by speaking into microphones our senior producer is Kevin Ferguson our producer is Jesus Ambrosio production fellows at Maximum Fun are Richard Roby and Valerie Moffat we get help from Casey O'Brien our interstitial music is by Dan Wally also known as DJW Our theme song is called Huddle Formation. It's recorded by the group The Go Team. Thanks to them and to their label Memphis Industries for sharing it with us. You can also keep up with our show on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We post our interviews in all those places. I think that's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. NPR.